All right, welcome. Today, we're going to talk about how to coach a client who wants to create a high-performing culture. So my name is Andrew Knightlick. I'm the director and founder of the Center for Executive Coaching. Thanks for taking the time to be here. I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll take questions at the end, I think, using chat, but uh, pop your questions into the chat anytime if, if I see anything uh, that, that seems relevant. I'd be delighted to try to answer it. Uh, what I'd like to do in the first couple of minutes, I just want to introduce myself, introduce the Center for Executive Coaching, and especially show you where this piece of the curriculum um, lies in our overall uh, curriculum. So I, I started coaching, I don't know, 22 years ago now, just before the turn of the millennium. And I've loved it ever since. I work from a home office. I choose great clients. Uh, I travel all around when I want to, especially before COVID. I think it's starting up again. Uh, the travel, that is, hopefully not COVID. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've got into write books, speak at, speak at great organizations. Um, when I work with clients, it's on their most pressing issues. The way I got into coaching was that I was a management consultant first, uh, specializing in healthcare, but doing both strategic management consulting and operations improvement work. And time and time again, what would happen is the client, when we presented our 500 page PowerPoint, they'd say, you know, Andrew, thanks for this. I agree. This is exactly what I was thinking. And after a while, I couldn't help but I said, you know, you just plunked down a quarter of a million dollars for this report and you already knew the answer. So help, help me understand this. And what they would often say is, look, I don't need your team of analysts. I, I, I feel like I know what to do. What I really, where I really get value is in the meetings that we have together these one-on-one -on -one meetings because you don't have an agenda, you're an advocate for me, you listen, and I can talk to you about issues I couldn't talk to members of my board about or colleagues about, and you help me get clarity. And so at a certain point, I realized like, I don't really love traveling around every week to clients. I don't really love managing a big team of analysts. And so why not just do that part, the part that they say they like and they value. And, and that's essentially how I became a coach. I just listened to what clients wanted. And since that time, I've just loved my work. Uh, people started coming to me to be trained as a coach. And uh, once uh, I didn't know who they were anymore, we started the Center for Executive Coaching right around 2006. We've trained 2,500 coaches since then. So as you can see, we're not a very big organization compared to some of the other massive, uh, dare I say, cattle call type organizations. We're a boutique organization. We specialize specifically in working with high-end professionals, people who are already successful and know they want to be executive coaches. We're accredited with the ICF uh, as well. And if you're interested, right, the, the reason I do these is to give you a sense of our curriculum, our content, what we teach. Um, if you have interest after this session, just reach out. We can have a strategy session to see if it's a fit. You know, all I ask is that you've reviewed our website, you know our pricing, you understand our programs, and you know, you're ready to take action within a, a month or two if, if, if you see a mutual fit. I don't enjoy, and I don't think you'd enjoy academic discussions. Uh, that's not really uh, what I want to do or how I want to use my time. You can le learn more about our programs right here. You click Get Certified. Um, you can see a program overview. Uh, our core program is our distance program. It includes everything except for 10 hours of mentor coaching for the ICF and our three-day certification seminar. I'm clicking there now because we do have just a couple of spots left. We tend to sell out about a month ahead. So our next one is March 28th to the 30th. We have a few spots for that. It's a three-day seminar. Again, you can just go to the website and review if you're interested, okay? And again, re reach out anytime for a strategy session. You can just go to contact here. And there we are. This is actually my cell phone. I put my cell phone here so that people can reach me anytime uh, and members know that as well. You know, we, we pride ourselves in pretty instant response. Okay, you'll even see my direct email there. All right, so that's the ask. Let's talk about where we are in the program, right? And, and by the way, the, the pro, what I'm going to do today because of the large number of attendees we have is very different than how we do it in our actual program, right? We don't use Zoom webinar like we're using today. We use Zoom meeting. We often have breakout groups. We do practice. It's much more interactive uh, than what I'll be able to do today. I hope you understand, uh, you know, there's a vetting process. We wanna make sure the right people come into our program um, and, and, and that's when we can get 
more interactive. What you see on the screen now is the member area. When you join our program, you get an extensive library of coaching tools, methods, um, and, uh, and resources, including hours and hours of video. So you have pretty much a just-in-time library for almost any coaching situation that comes up for you. And uh, that's particularly in executive and leadership coaching. And if there's something you don't see, just reach out. We can have a conversation. But by the time we get to today's presentation, today's class, which is on culture, creating a high-performing culture, um, you will have already understood what the core coaching conversation is. We have about six hours going through how do you really set up a coaching session? What, what, how do you start it strong? How do you end it strong? What is a coaching conversation? How does it differ from consulting and therapy? We talk about the process of coaching and how to assess the client and the situation. We go through a, a survey course of all of the top assessment tools and approaches. So you already have that, okay? And then we will have covered a number of coaching solutions already. In your member area, as I say, you get a just-in-time library of coaching solutions. We start with a 360-degree verbal assessment, um, an executive development plan, behavioral and perceptual coaching, and then just about every situation that's going to come your way when you're coaching leaders, right? How do you help a leader communicate with more impact? How do you help them with a high stakes influence conversation? How do you help them when they're overwhelmed, especially about time and competing priorities, which is a huge area of coaching today, leadership and executive presence, coaching on the personal domains when appropriate, helping them improve their professional relationships up, down, across and outside, helping them in improve employee engagement. That's another huge topic today helping them resolve unproductive conflict, um, team coaching, thinking strategically and strategic planning, coaching on leading change, right? Like today's presentation fits within the subset of change. We're changing the culture, but there's other forms of change that we discuss and cover. Succession planning, service excellence, mergers, developing a, a, a strong board. Today, we're doing high-performing culture, executing effectively. There's a whole career success bundle including success in a new role. Most of my most recent coaching engagements in my own practice are that. And then we have a nice business coaching bundle for coaching the growing business and the business owner, as well as thinking comprehensively. So you basically get a library. Let me just show you one, like engaging employees. If we click that, you're gonna see there's a, a summary, an executive summary of the toolkit or approach. There's a whole methodology, a slide deck. I'll show you these for culture change in a minute. And you get a bunch of, pre-recorded classes that you can go through at your own pace. So you get this ongoing just-in-time library. So by the time we get to culture change, we'll have covered a lot of situational coaching classes. A lot of things about how do you coach the individual to be a better leader? How do you coach them to form stronger relationships? How do you coach them to build strong teams? And now we're at a piece of our curriculum which is about how do you do coaching when it's about the organization, things like creating a strong culture, succession planning, strategy and execution, all of the things like that. I found some coaches really just like the individual leadership coaching. How can you coach someone to be a better leader? But in the market, clients often want to talk first about the big things that they're paid to do. How do we create strategy? How do I lead change? How do I change the culture to be more about performance? And so in those discussions, we get at how can you be a better leader? I find uh, it's really helpful to have that whole range of coaching available to you. All right. So with that, let me get to today's presentation. Uh, again, ask uh, questions any anytime you have them. So with any of our coaching solutions, you get three documents, okay? And these are for members of the Center for Executive Coaching only, all right? They're proprietary. You can use these, you can co-brand them, you can change them as long as you attribute them to the Center for Executive Coaching. Um, uh, and, and we're really good with that. You just can't use them to train other coaches. So what you'll receive is a one, page, you know, every, everything we do comes with like a one or two page executive summary. You get a whole book of about 67 pages. That's that. You also get, about a thousand pages of coaching methods, tools, and distinctions, in this case, high performance culture. And you'll see there's, there's a bunch of uh, exposition about when to use the tool, what you'll hear from the client that tells you you might want to go this way, a coaching plan for just about every situation, other 
coaching solutions or tools that might come into play. We give you proposal language that you might use and practical tips. And then we jump right into the actual tool itself. So, and, and what that looks like is we're actually giving you areas of inquiry that are likely to come up and potential coaching questions that might come up. Uh, now this is in workbook form. You wouldn't give this to a client, but this just tends to help us teach this uh, to coaches. Okay, so it's pretty cool. You really get a, a turnkey approach to coaching. Um, having said that, we're accredited with the ICF. Everything we do is still about letting the client guide the process and following ICF core competencies. The issue here though, is a lot of times client and coach get stuck. And so what these methods, tools, and distinctions allow you to do is when you feel stuck or the client's stuck, it allows you to add a level of richness and robustness to the conversation. You can say to the client, you know, would it be helpful if I brought out some frameworks or tools to help you? The client every time will say, yes, we can introduce a distinction or a tool, and then we can go back to coaching the client and say, you know, how do you want to apply that? That fits perfectly well within the ICF core competencies uh, the coach is allowed to make observations uh, and encouraged to, but has to go where the client wants to go. So think of the tributaries of a river, like the Amazon. You know, a good coach wants to explore the various tributaries with the client's permission to make sure they're doing the fullest exploration of an issue moving towards new insights and results. That's what our tools and distinctions are meant to do. And you also receive with most of these, like almost all of them, uh, a PowerPoint. I've used these PowerPoints for keynote speeches, training, group coaching and facilitation. So you really get a bunch of turnkey, um, turnkey solutions ready to go that you can use and adapt. Okay, so with that, we're ready to actually jump into the content that was promised today, which is how to coach a client on high performance culture. Okay, um, the agenda is here, but I'll just I'll just lead you through a process for how to do it, starting with a little bit of theory. I love the picture here. I was an anthropology major undergraduate, and this picture is pretty similar to the picture on the very first anthropology book I had to read um, about a, a culture in South America. Um, and the thing with anthropology and looking at cultures is we're there to observe and not judge. We're not there to change the culture. Uh, in organizations, leaders often have to change the culture. Uh, and so that, that's a really important distinction between academic anthropology and looks at culture uh, with what we have to do as coaches and what our clients have to do. Okay, let me just give you two examples from research. In our program, we're never gonna beat you over the head with research like too many other programs do. We're not academic, we're practical, but I always wanna prove to uh, our members that what we do is rooted uh, in the research. So let me just show you two quick studies uh, that I, I think are best known when it comes to culture work. Uh, one by uh, Cameron and Quinn that you see here. What they did was create a grid with uh, two competing values on, on, on the uh, y-axis you see flexibility and stability. On the x-axis you see is it more internally focused or, or, or uh, externally focused. And that gets you four types of cultures that they identified. The clan, the adhocracy, the market, and the hierarchy. You can think about uh, companies that you know, and which is which. Again, I'm, I'm not going to beat you over the head with this, but a clan culture is friendly, family-like, loyalty, participation. It's all about consensus, empowerment, team building. The adhocracy is more about creativity, risk-taking, new products, and innovation, promoting individual initiative and freedom, right? I, I would think Apple and Google might fit there. Market, is about the market-driven culture, finish work, make things happen, be goal-driven, hire people who are drivers. There's rivalry, competition is a key value. I might think about maybe some investment banks. And hierarchy, I think about the US military structure, uh, maybe some healthcare organizations, they often are formal and structured work environments. There's rules and policies, keep the organization running smoothly and so on. All right, so that's one research study that identified types of cultures um, in this other study, they also came up with a, the, the researchers, Groisberg, Lee, and a bunch of others came up with uh, eight cultures. You can see this in the culture factor. Um, here they looked at how people interact, whether it's independent or interdependent, and how they respond to change, whether they respond in a stable, stable way or a flexible way. And they identified eight culture types. And here you could see the percentage of companies uh, reporting that they associate with these values. 
the biggest one is results. 89% want to create a results-focused culture, uh, followed by a culture of caring, order. And then you can see it decreases significantly from there. Purpose, safety, learning. Learning was an interesting one in this research study because 7% of companies said they associate with these values and 94% said they wanted this value to increase, which is good news for coaching, authority, and enjoyment. Um, what they found internationally was, uh, and uh, intersection, uh, inter-industry and all of that is that results and caring were number one and two throughout. The other attributes varied based on the industry, region, strategic priority, and design. What was interesting from their findings was that when companies have strong alignment about the culture, there's higher engagement. But if someone needs to change the culture, it's much harder. Those cultures tend to be more resistant to change, uh, whereas companies that have more chaos, that is lower alignment about the culture, represent better opportunities for a leader to come in and shape the culture. Uh, and so that's, that's just, that's interesting, but it makes sense, right? It's harder to change a culture when you have a steadfast, long-term uh, culture with lots of alignment. All right. What I'm going to do as a coach with a client is I'm going to work with the client to say, what kind of culture do you want to create, right? Independent of all that research, I, I don't want to give my client a list of possible cultures, right? It's about performance. And so we're creating the culture the client wants to do. This is a perfect case for coaching. Right. The key is, is your client's culture working or not? And you can see this. I love Dilbert, uh, but here they're celebrating because they're in a culture where you can do nothing <laughs> and still get paid. So the big question, you know, why do you want to change your culture? Well, does your culture work or not? All right. I'm going to share with you today a key metaphor uh, that I've used with clients to the, to, to the point of actually bringing one of these fountains to retreats that we would do. I like this metaphor of the chocolate fountain. I've worked with a number of consulting firms and OD firms that do culture change. Some of them use different metaphors. That's fine. What I like about this is these chocolate fountains that you see at weddings, right? You see two in this picture, one big multi-tiered one and one smaller. It looks like a white chocolate three-tiered one. But regardless, most organizations have layers. And in most organizations, the culture comes from the top, just as the chocolate comes from the top of these. And the goal with one of these is that we want a nice smooth flow of delicious, pure chocolate. The problem in many organizations is somewhere in this fountain, you get something that looks like chocolate, but isn't chocolate. And our job as coaches is to work with our clients to figure out what's going on. I brought one of, I didn't bring one, but I did one of these retreats at a country club where the client brought out one of these chocolate fountains. And in the middle of the retreat, the thing started sputtering and it got all stuck and it was just awesome. Uh, because everyone at the meeting associated that with what was going on with their culture. But anyway, once you see this metaphor, you know, the coaching is really quite straightforward. We're going to coach at the top. Let's start at the top of the fountain. Let's see what kind of chocolate our leader wants to create. And then let's make sure it's flowing to the next level and the next level and the next level. And uh, I find this works really well. Okay, so this metaphor, keep it in mind. I found it to be really powerful for clients and it makes the process easy. Before we get into the process, let, let me just talk about nine key mistakes. And by the way, type into the chat any mistakes you've seen when you've done culture work. When I say mistakes, I mean mistakes um, that the client makes. All right, number one, I don't know, I've seen this in some healthcare organizations where senior leaderships decide they absolutely wanna change the culture so they go to their marketing department first and they say, we need a name for this thing and we need banners and we need a big marketing campaign, but none of the culture work has even happened yet, right? So this fanfare first is very dangerous because employees are trained to get cynical when they see stuff like this. I like what Robert says, thinking culture change is only about training. That's a good one. Next, how many of you have seen this, the boondoggle retreat and follow-up where Executives go away to Fiji or Hawaii, they play golf, maybe uh, one drunken evening, they say, well, we better do some work. And they say, here's the culture we want. They come back and they say, here, employees, you need to go first, get this done. Related to that, I did some work with one of the top um, culture change consulting firms in the world. 
uh, a, you know, a long time ago. That's at least, but they were known for culture change and they would get fired half the time. Half the time they get fired, but they were the best in the world. It was like mind boggling to me. And when I talked to them about what happened, what do you think happened? Why, why do you think the best company in the world at this, at least 25 years ago, would get fired half the time? Not, yeah, that's it. People don't really want to change, as Deborah says. What happens is leadership thought they were outsourcing the change to a consulting firm. And this firm would come back to them and say, no, you have to model the behaviors you want to see. You're part of this. You might have to do the work and change. And sure enough, they didn't want to do it. Right. So culture change work is hard. We have to find clients that want to do the work. Uh, four, how many of you have been at a company where the leader is so lazy? You know, they say, I have a message I want from people. I want them to adopt a culture, but I don't really want to do the work. So everyone gets a book. You can get the Toyota way, the who moved my cheese, the Zappos experience. There's a million books with all sorts of culture. Uh, Toyota way was big in healthcare for a while until the airbags stuff started happening. Five, going to you and saying, well, just give me a menu of options and I'll pick the ones as if it's a, uh, a restaurant or something like that. Six, you see this a lot in upstart tech companies. They mistake culture for perks, enjoyment, ping pong tables, massages, things like that. Um, seven, I've seen uh, some organizations take a cultural virtue that they want and overdo it. So it becomes a weakness. What do I mean by this? A great example is collaboration. Perhaps you've worked in a collaborative culture that was so collaborative, nobody could get anything done, right? The leaders came in and said, we want a collaborative culture. And people abused that to the point where if someone goes into their manager and says, you know, I have an idea and the manager goes back and forth with them and the employee says, well, I still think my idea is good. And the, the manager says, well, you're not being collaborative or everyone can say no, but nobody's willing to say yes. Number eight, we have to be aware of the whole organization. Sometimes leadership is on page 50 of a culture that they wanna create and employees haven't even opened the book yet. And finally, as I think some of you have mentioned in the chat, not budgeting enough time, one of you put in, you know, it takes seven years to change a culture. I think that depends on the size of the organization we're talking about. Uh, most of the engagements I'm involved in are anywhere from 12 months to 24 months when it's about culture change. And, and that's enough to get some momentum going. Okay. So with that, let me take you through this process. The beauty of this process and the message that I want to get across to Center for Executive Coaching members when we get to this point is that if you can coach one person, you can actually coach an organization to change their culture. And that could be some of the most rewarding, uh, dare I say, transformative work an organization can do. And all you have to do is be able to coach one person. So that's why we start in our program with how to coach one person effectively. But if you're working at the top of an organization, this can be a very, very successful and powerful process and will often lead to having you coach others at different levels. It can lead to some retreats, workshops, training, a whole solution to make a massive difference. Okay. So let's jump in. Step one, I am not going to accept an engagement about culture change unless I'm clear with the client on why they want to do this, right? I'm not big into change for change's sake. There needs to be a serious market driver or strategic driver that is forcing the change or the organization simply not performing at the level needed. Something has to be going on that's going to be worth all the pain and hassle and time of changing the culture to what we're going to call high performance. Okay, usually it's we're not performing well. There's new competitors. Amazon's just come in and said they're entering this sector, whatever it is. Uh, and I'm going to unsell my client for a while. I don't want to get fired half the time. And I don't. I get fired 0% of the time when it's about culture change. One of the reasons why is it's almost never the first engagement I do with a client. This is really important. Okay. There may be some of you who are on this webinar who are life coaches or transformational coaches or ontological coaches. There's a big problem with that kind of coaching right off the bat. And it's that your client doesn't trust you enough to be vulnerable. Right. I found in the executive and leadership coaching market, you get hired first for something that's relatively safe for the client. 
So I almost always have at least one, if not two, coaching engagements already done with a client about something. How can we improve engagement? You know, something about, you know, there's one behavior I've received feedback about. I need to be, you know, put in place a new habit to be a better leader. We've done work together. I know that they're coachable. I know that they want to get better. And that gives me an instant advantage over the firm that had to jump in and, you know, take big revenue dollars to make a big revenue target. Um, I can say no. The other thing that happens is because I've worked with them, they confide in me and I hear their complaints and concerns. And so when they start saying, you know, I, this culture really isn't working, we need to change the culture. I can talk to them about that outside the coaching and say, you know, I think I can help you with that. Maybe that's our next engagement or some add on work. Would you like to do it? But I always start by unselling them. I say, why? Because if you can't come up with the why, you're not going to come up with a powerful message that engages and aligns and enrolls the organization and gets them excited, or at least understanding why we're doing it. So the why is where we have to start. If the why is not there, I'm not moving forward. Second, we're going to define the culture we want. And what I found is a number of coaches who at least haven't been through our uh, training, only do the first of the three things you see on this screen. And that is the adjectives. What do you want the culture to look like, right? And, and you'll get stuff that's really fluffy, stuff like, I want it fun. I want everyone to be proactive. And that's not enough. Uh, true coaching, the best coaching, goes from these general adjectives or all or nothing thinking or generalities, fluff, if you will, to specific behaviors, habits, and performance metrics, right? We're talking about high-performing culture here. That's specifically the topic. The leader wants to go to a culture that performs better. Okay, so let me give you two examples. One, in the book, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, there is a phenomenal case study about Alcoa, the aluminum company global aluminum company. I highly recommend you read that book anyway, uh, because it also has great case studies about changing behaviors. But when Paul O'Neill took over Alcoa, it was a struggling company. He went to Wall Street and he totally disappointed them with his speech. Instead of saying, we're gonna be more profitable, we're gonna grow faster, the things Wall Street wants to hear, he said, we're gonna be the safest company in the world. We're gonna create a culture of safety. So that was his adjective, safety. And of course, <laughs> Wall Street hated it, but they were very happy not long after. But he didn't finish there, right? Because again, he was a good leader. And this is how we're going to coach our leaders. We're going to say, so what behaviors and habits does that mean? Because safety could mean lots of things. He instituted two rules in Alcoa. And the book, again, is The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. So he instituted two behaviors he wanted to see in the company. One, anytime, anywhere in the world that there was an accident, an injury, any kind of injury, what was to happen was there was to be a chain of command or a communication change so that he was woken up wherever he was, whatever time of day or night, he would be woken up and notified that there was an injury, right? Imagine that alone, that you have to call the CEO and say, well, we just had an injury in our plant. And, and imagine that conversation. Number two, once the injury was, and by the way, you'd be fired if you didn't report the injury. Even if it was minor and you said, well, we can handle it, you'd be fired if you didn't report it, right? He was going to send a strong message. He was modeling what he was going to tolerate and not tolerate. And number two, once an injury was reported, some sort of committee or task force or team, whatever you want to call it, was put in place to make sure that that injury for that reason never happened again in the company. And as a result of these two behaviors, the company became incredibly productive. Why? Because usually safety incidents happen because a process is broken. It's inefficient. There's too many handoffs. And so this forced everybody to look carefully at all of the processes at the company. And as a result, the company got a heck of a lot more productive and they couldn't resist. By they, I mean the unions couldn't resist because you know, by saying, well, this is costing us jobs because it was about safety. How could, how could someone argue against safety? And management couldn't resist saying, well, we're too lean and efficient already because again, it was about lives. It was about safety. And so the company became, I don't know whether O'Neill meant for this to happen, whether he saw it ahead of time or not, 
but the company became incredibly productive and profitable. And of course, they measured safety all along. And the company became safer in terms of injuries than many accounting firms, if the case study is accurate. Okay, so that's one example. When I work with a client, after we figure out the why, I'm not going to tolerate stuff like I want us to have a fun culture. I want people to be proactive. I want to define what they mean by a culture of performance. And I'm going to be on equal footing with my client and I'm going to challenge them to get there. From my own coaching, I'll give you an example from a university. I worked with an extension department of a US university. For those outside the United States who might not know what an extension unit is, we have 17 land grant universities with a specialty in agriculture and farming. And what these universities would do is create extension departments to go out to the farms and take their research about best practices in agriculture and, and transfer them practically to the farmland out there. And over time, these extension units grew and grew and grew. They basically became very large adult education units. So I worked with one of uh, the, the leaders of one of these, very big budget state university. And he said, we want to be more entrepreneurial. That was his adjective. And uh, he didn't really want to argue with me, but he would let me go out and interview some, some of uh, the key employees to say, well, how do you feel about this? And when I did, they said, we don't know what this guy is talking about. We have no idea. He keeps saying, be entrepreneurial, be entrepreneurial. We don't even know what that means, right? So that was good. I could go back to him and say, they don't know what it means. We got to come up with some behaviors, habits, and performance metrics. He came up with two behaviors. One, you have to learn how to write grants. Two, so right, instead of relying on government funding, we have to learn how to write grants. We have to go to nonprofits and foundations and write grants for our programs. And number two, you have to ask for money for our programs. You have to stop giving our programs away for free. We have to charge for them, charge the public and the users for them, even though we're a state university. Those were the two behaviors. And the performance metric he came up with was we need half, we're probably gonna lose half of our funding. Our government is broke. Our state government is broke. We're gonna be laid off uh, in droves. We're gonna lose our budget if we don't change. So half of our budget needs to come outside of government. It needs to come from grants, and from charging the public, and that's all there is to it. I got to go back to the uh, employees again and interview them about this, and they said, all right, we understand what he's saying, but we don't know how to write grants, and we don't know how to ask for money. You know, we, we don't know how to sell, if you will. We're uncomfortable doing it. So at least we knew what we had to do, right? At least they agreed, okay, we get it. It's clear now. We just don't know how to do it, or we're uncomfortable doing it. Well, we could work with that. Does that make sense? Before we do anything, we got to spend some time with the why, right? In both cases, Paul O'Neill had a very clear why. Alcoa was not performing. My client was going to lose half the funding, right? Compelling reason to change the culture and to define performance, right? Don't do an exercise in academic, fluffy coaching. If there's not a why and if there's not specifics, you're going to be disappointed. And so is your client. So now... Unlike so many culture change initiatives and organizations, we're not going to announce anything. We're not going to go to marketing and do fanfare. We're not going to take the executive team to Hawaii and play golf. I'm going to coach the top leader. That's it. It might be six to 12 months just coaching the top leader and maybe some members of the executive team. Right here, we're going to simplify and say there's just one leader. Sometimes I'll do this with a group of five. It just depends on the organization and their needs. Right? And we're going to say, what do you have to do? How can you, you know, this is classic Gandhi, right? Be the change you want to see, right? What are your own attitudes, behaviors that you're going to have to model to create the new culture? Where are you going to spend your time? With whom? How can you set new expectations? Uh, one of my favorite coaching questions, what are you tolerating? What are you going to stop tolerating, right? Where is their poor performance? In the case of Alcoa in the uh, Duhigg book, he mentions one of the top performers in the company did not report some injuries happening in his plant. And uh, once the uh, CEO, once O'Neill found out about this, as it turned out, some nuns reported this person at the shareholder meeting. Uh, he fired that leader. That leader could have been a future CEO. He fired him. That's a really strong example of saying, I am not tolerating people who don't live the culture that I want to create. Right? So there might be six to 12 months of behavioral coaching in my 
uh, university example, I had to work with my client who was a tenured faculty member, very unaccustomed to tough leadership uh, about how to be more assertive. He didn't understand how to have tough conversations. And so we worked really hard on who do you have to set expectations with? We role played those conversations. We debriefed those conversations. We talked about how we had to start spending more time out in the field with leaders, how we had to get them support. There's a lot of work here. Keep in mind, by the way, that a lot of people, you know, like I'm never going to do this for Ford Motor or a major Fortune 500 company. We've had graduates who do work at that level, at the CEO level. My niche is more that, you know, up to $250 million size mid cap company. I really like working there. I don't have to go through HR. I can go right to the decision maker. I can tap into the consulting budget. I also work with a couple billion dollar healthcare systems. Those are also easy to work with at the top and get things happen. The point I'm making is it's much easier to do it this way in those types of organizations, okay? So the top leaders go first. Again, you can see some of the coaching areas of inquiry that we get into. What attitudes, what behaviors, how will you set the tone? What will you stop tolerating? What will you measure? How will you spend your time? How will you invest money differently? You know, what do you have to do so you've earned the right to lead? And how can you better get each employee to buy in and show that discretionary effort that is needed in times like these? The other piece that we're going to do with the top leader that a lot of coaches miss is not just about like, how do you have to show up as a leader, but where do you invest? Okay, any culture change, any change comes with investment. And some coaches forget this. Coach, some coaches don't like to have these tough conversations. If you join our program, you're going to learn you have to have these. And so where are we going to recruit differently to find the people who fit in with this new culture? How do we have to change performance management so that we're rewarding people who do the right things and we're acting appropriately for people who aren't? Do we need new career paths? What training do we need? Do we have to change how decisions get made like uh, uh, O'Neill did when it came time to a communication chain to create a communication chain related to injury reporting? What, how do we change our reward systems, job design, reporting structure? What technology do we need? You know, sometimes technologies can help. Okay, so there's a parallel conversation going on about investment in new structures, new systems, new ways of doing things. This is super important, all right? So now we're gonna work with our leader at some point to start bringing it to the next level of the chocolate fountain, if you don't mind that metaphor. And they're gonna do that through individual and group meetings, right? And we might role play. We gotta make sure the messaging is clear. We go back to that all important, why are you doing this? And you know, here's a template that sometimes can work. You know, here's where we've been. Here's why that's not working and why we need to change. Here's where we're going. Here's why that's exciting for individuals. Here's what you're doing well. Here's what I might want you to do differently. And what are your thoughts? How can I support you in moving forward? I'm reminded of the book, Good to Great and the flywheel metaphor that the authors promoted there. This, this is about change. This is about getting that giant wheel turning. So we're going to coach our client on the conversations they need to have in groups and with individuals, particularly at that next level of leadership, to start getting this flywheel moving all the while putting in place new structures. And then guess what? It's like the instructions on any shampoo bottle, lather, rinse, repeat. We're going to repeat it at the next level, the next level, and so on. Again, as I said, most of the companies I work in don't have uh, more than a few levels. So it's not that terribly challenging, maybe five levels at most. And this can lead to really exciting work, right? With one group, what we found was um, at the top level, the top five, um, everything was great. Everyone was on board. The right team was in place. At the next level of 15, the leadership team below the executive team, what we found were people were going rogue. They were a little bit confused about the message from the top. And they were sending messages out that was com were, were confusing their own teams. So we brought them together and I got to work with them on a communication workshop, essentially 
the senior leadership team said, look, here's the umbrella message about the change, why we need it. And now what I want each of you to do, this was their homework actually, is, is I want you to present your message and we're gonna give you feedback. And your message needs to be consistent with the umbrella message we have and also needs to resonate with the specific needs of your unit and the, the group that you're leading. And so we did that. Sometimes it leads to individual coaching, you know, coaching with someone who's high potential, but, you know, needs to make some changes to adapt to the culture we want to see. So this is very, very exciting work. I love doing it. And again, if you can coach just one person, you can coach a whole organization to change its culture. Once again, we start with the why. We move to defining the culture in terms of adjectives, behaviors, habits, and performance metrics. And then we look at the top leader, top leader habits and behaviors to model the culture, structural changes. We go from there to group meetings as needed, individual plans for each direct report. And we keep repeating this on and on and on. And at, meanwhile, I'm coaching my client. I'm saying what's working, what's not working. You know, at a certain point, maybe they can do a survey, a culture survey to see how well are they doing? How consistent is the messaging? Are people adapting the culture? What are their concerns? Maybe I can do that work, right? My model for coaching is really less about being a pure coach and more about being a trusted advisor, right? There's a lot of things I can do for a client that's not just coaching and I'm happy to do it. And then finally, throughout, we're tracking progress, right? I'm going to coach my client. Again, culture change is not, do you remember the uh, judge who talked about pornography? He says, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. We don't want that happening with our leader, where they say, I, I don't really know how to define the culture and when we're done. I'll just know it when I see it. No, we want to see clear progress, right? With my client at the university, progress was what percentage of funding is coming from grants and charging. And we could literally create graphs and show that every week. In the case of Alcoa, it was the safety. Uh, you know, days without an accident, overall safety, types of injuries, they were tracking progress. And so that opens us up to meet with the team to talk about progress and any mid-course corrections that we might need, all right? So there you go. This is one of my favorite types of assignments. I hope you see where this fits in, in terms of the overall structure and curriculum of the Center for Executive Coaching. In our classes, we'll do case studies. We'll practice. I might simulate one of the clients I've had and have people coach me through a tough issue. We'll often, you know, because our members come from, uh, you know, really strong backgrounds are in, and are often doing this work, sometimes they'll have issues they want to be coached on. So we really get into how do you coach people on each of the situations that leaders will bring up. And yes, e each coaching topic comes with individual slide decks um, so that you can use those for speeches, for trainings. I use them sometimes for teaching. Okay, so let me take this off record. Let me take any questions you have about the program. If you're listening to the recording, reach out anytime. I'd love to have a strategy session with you about uh, whether the Center for Executive Coaching Makes sense for you and it's a mutual fit.